John Adams Street, central London, just up from Charing Cross, outside the Adelphi building where The Economist, perhaps the world's leading and most venerable liberal magazine about politics and economics, uh, reside. Um, but The Economist is concerned. They're celebrating their 175th anniversary. And on that 175th anniversary, a manifesto for renewing liberalism. The Economist, which is perhaps the global mouthpiece for liberalism, for democratic liberalism, say, liberalism made the modern world, but the modern world is turning against it. So The Economist is concerned, then we should all be concerned about the future of democracy. And we've come to The Economist to talk to Adrian Wardridge, their political editor and the Bajot columnist, about the future of democracy, the crisis of liberalism, and how to fix it. Yeah, here we have The Economist um, from volume one to now. Around here, this was all when Walter Badger was editor. Walter Badger was editor for 17 years, and he was not only the editor, but he was the, the Economist's only full-time employee. He had one assistant, so he basically did everything. He was writing like crazy, but he also managed at the same time to write for large numbers of other uh, magazines at the same time. So he wrote the, 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 the great his book, The English Constitution. He was writing the whole of The Economist and had so much energy and time left that he wrote for other magazines at the same time, which may, might explain the fact that he died when he was 53. It's extraordinary. I mean, you're just writing and writing and writing. Adrian Waldridge, the political editor of The Economist and uh, Badgett columnist. Adrian, is democracy dying? Dying is too strong a word, but democracy is in real trouble. I think from 1945 onwards until about 2000, we believed that democracy was the wave of the future. Democracy just kept going and going, getting deeper and stronger and spreading around the world. And since about 2000, it's started to retreat, and that retreat has got worse in the last few years. Uh, and the two most disturbing things about that retreat, I think, are that the two sort of great beacons of democracy are in trouble, judged from a purely democratic point of view. One, of course, is the United States, which is going through extraordinary turmoil at the moment and has Trump as a president, um, who is a sort of was elected democratically just, but seems to have a very soft spot for authoritarian regimes. And the second is the European Union, which is um, very dubious when it comes to democracy. It's run by an unaccountable, rather arrogant elite, which seems to sort of have the whip hand over democratically elected governments, such as the one in Britain, such as the one in Greece. Um, and is very contemptuous of a lot of the, uh, of the Eastern European governments. So there's a tension between the European Union and democracy, and there is a sort of disfigurement of democracy in the United States. You mentioned America and yeah. Trump and suggested that America was having problems with its democracy. But what's undemocratic about Trump? He was elected. It doesn't seem as if he's uh, pursuing some sort of coup of any kind. He seems to respect at least implicitly, the legal system of the country. In fact, he uses it all the time to sue people. Why is there a crisis of democracy in America? There's a crisis of democracy in America for two very obvious reasons. One is that when Trump is campaigning with his people, he is campaigning as a populist, not somebody who respects institutions. So it's us against them. It's the wisdom of the people. Why is that undemocratic? Because democracy in its best form depends on uh, a willingness to limit the, um, the power of the people through constitutional restraint and to respect the opposition. If you heard the phrase, the loyal opposition, coming out of Trump's mouth, you'd be very surprised. But there's something else going on, um, which is that um, Trump is, is, is sort of making money out of being president, most obviously, most obviously with the <laughs> Trump Hotel, <laughs> which well, most obviously, I'm being careful with my words, most obviously with the Trump Hotel just down the road from the White House. Uh, and that has a sort of emerging world, third world feel to it. America used to be the case that you could retire from being president and you wouldn't go into the business Isn't of making money. Isn't that a rather sort of patronising no. remark about the third world, as if Trump uh, is somehow making America third world, oh, and therefore uh, undemocratic? Uh, I don't think it's patronising. I think it's accurate. I think one of the things that Trump is, I think, people think of Trump as a fascist if they're on the left. That's a completely bogus, uh, uh, bogus comparison. What he is 
in too many ways, I think, is, is, is a Latin American style strongman. A Chavez. Yeah, a Chavez sort of figure. Or, 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 and, and that worries me. But the, the point or about, a Peron rather uh, than Peron, a Pinochet. Exactly. So democracy isn't working well in America. That's correct. It's malfunctioning. It's malfunctioning. It's malfunctioning in a completely different way. In a sense, the problem with American democracy is almost that it's too democratic. That uh, you have lots and lots of power given Small to the D. people. Uh, the problem with European de democracy, of course, and that, and you know, there is a profound crisis in European democracy. Is, it's, is in many ways, it's not democratic enough. You have an unelected group of uh, Eurocrats who are obsessed with certain certain principles, freedom of movement of the re and, and the rest, who have jobs that aren't contingent upon performance upon, upon being re-elected, re who are increasingly in conflict with national governments. As I say, Italy, Greece, Britain. Uh, Hungary, um, many uh, Poland, uh, and that is a very dangerous system. You certainly wouldn't look at Europe now if you were an African and say that is a wonderful democratic system which we want to which we want to imitate. The same with the United States. It used to be the case that if you were in the emerging world, you would look at America, look at Europe, and say we want to be like them. Increasingly, they look at those political systems and say, yeah, we want to be like China. So the greatest book of liberalism in the 19th century is a description and celebration of the rise of a democratic liberal power. The, the coming power that is defining the world for the 19th century and beyond is the United States. And Tocqueville's a bit nervous about democracy, but in the end he says, this is the wave of the future and this is a good thing. Now, if you were to write a book about the great rising power of the 21st century, it would probably be about China. And China is absolutely the antithesis of democracy because it isn't, it's an anti-individualist state. It regards the individual as, uh, uh, as an atom, an ant, as part of the system. It's a surveillance society. Um, and it, it's a society that doesn't believe in, in, in restraints on the power of the state. It believes that people exist to serve the state, not the state to observe the people. So we've gone from the 19th century where liberalism was the coming thing to the 21st century where, as exactly as you describe it, surveillance capitalism is, is the coming thing. We always used to think that capitalism and democracy in somehow, somehow were inseparable and that the advance of capitalism would also be the advance of democracy. Now we're seeing exactly the opposite. That the so we got totally wrong. There was nothing, anything but the end of history. It was anything but the end of history. Now I think that, that, that capitalism and, and democracy could quite often be aligned. They were for much of the, uh, the second half of the 20th century, but now they've be, again become separate. You think of those, those people at, at Davos listening to, to, to the president of China, talking about how he believes in free trade and free markets. They're all saying, wonderful, marvelous. Let's, they like him. They don't like Trump. Trump is the, you know, whatever his faults, is the Democrat. He is the authoritarian. But the business people want smooth markets, even if it means no rights for, for, for individuals in that context. Now, that's extremely worrying. So explain what the difference is, if there is one, between liberalism in a British sense or a global sense as opposed to the American sense and democracy. Are they the same thing? No. Uh, liberalism precedes democracy in many ways. A lot of the early liberals are skeptical about democracy, but ultimately liberalism and democracy are completely compatible because what liberalism is about is about the idea that, that the, the world should be ordered on the basis of the rights, abilities and responsibilities of individuals, that you should make your own life, that life isn't determined by where you're born, um, which is the sort of old aristocratic view of things. So although the early liberals are skeptical about democracy, they make their peace with democracy very rapidly because they realize that democracy is part of the liberal project. Their point of, so l democracy is part of liberalism, but it isn't exactly the same as liberalism. And one of the things that liberals always say is that democracy is a great thing, providing that you don't confuse it with populism, with the idea that the people are all wise, that everything must be decided by plebiscite, that democracy is so important, so powerful, that it has to be in some way, ways limited by constitutional rules. You have to have representative democracy, you have to have bills of rights which, which enshrine the, the, the rights of individuals in law, you have to have checks and balances, you have to have institutions like courts which uh, limit the, 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 the power of uh, the demos to make decisions. So it's constitutional democracy that, that, that it's all about. And I think one of the things that's happened in the last few years, we had a glorious period, I think, when this preoccupation with constitutionalism and this preoccupation with the populace, with the will of the people, were the same thing. 
that democracy was seen as liberal democracy. And what we've seen since 2000 is a separation between the two things, that you have on the one hand populism, which says that democracy is the will of the people, um, that's Trumpism in many ways. And on or the, Brexit. Or Brexit. On the other hand, you have constitutionalism, which says that um, liberalism is all about constitutional rules, about um, a, a stable set of rules. Uh, is, is, and that's that sort of elite view of liberalism, which is all about uh, is, is all about these rules and restraints, has become separated. So you have the European Union, which is all about fundamental rights, which is all about the rule of experts, which is all about which is all about the formal side of constitutional restraints, separating... Almost 19th century liberalism. Almost 19th century liberalism. That's what it is, I think. Uh, separating out from democracy. And when you have these two things at war with each other, as you do now, you have a very dangerous situation. Coming back to America, I, I know you've written quite a lot about the politics of identity engulfing the left in America. To what extent is that also undermining democracy? Massively. Uh, massively, because the, the, the notion... And you might explain what the politics yes, of identity is. Yeah, the politics of identity is essentially that different groups of people have different and probably irreconcilable interests that are built into their biology, to their gender, to their ethnicity. But if you're saying that people have irreconcilable interests based upon their group identity, uh, that's a very dangerous thing for democracy because it creates the politics of, of, of group antagonism. We've seen that in, in, in India for the last hundred years with devastating consequences. Also, people are going further than that. They're saying that the, the validity of an argument uh, is not uh, determined by its logical consistency or its empirical validation, but on who's saying it. So people say speaking as a black woman, speaking as a white man. Does that mean people can't talk to one another anymore? It means it's very is that essential to, talk. to democracy? Not just a, uh, essential to democracy, it is essential to democracy, but it's essential to the liberal order. Badgett, in whose name I write, said that liberalism is essentially uh, the politics of discussion. It means that you can discuss things, people with different views, different outlooks, different interests, discuss things and they come to reasonable solutions on the basis of discussion. This is the politics of refusal to discuss. It's saying that speaking as a black man or speaking as a black woman, I cannot come to a reasoned agreement with you because you've had different historical experiences from me and we will never agree on anything. Some people will be watching this and say a typical position of a, a, a dominant white male, a, sure. a senior person at The Economist, sure. how would you respond to that? I would respond to that by saying that, that that's an extremely dangerous argument, partly because it argues that there can't be any empathy between people, that people who've had a certain historical experience can't empathise with people who've had different historical experiences. Um, and I think that, that makes a mockery of the whole of, 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 of human literature, of, of the whole of the humanities. The humanities are about um, the possibility of having empathy with people who've had different experiences from you. I also say it's nonsense because it says that, says that my interests are ultimately, because of my position in society, because of my race, because of my gender, ultimately irreconcilable with their interests. In other words, we have a, a world of, of groups which are in fundamental conflict with each other. I don't think that's true. I think that the interests of lots and lots of different groups are reconcilable, and I think that they're reconcilable through economic growth, through parliamentary institutions, through liberal institutions, and through reason, debate, and discussion. So, do you think to strengthen democracy, or at least to solve this current crisis, the left, the progressive left, generally has to get beyond the politics of identity, or at least temper it? I think they have to get beyond the politics of identity. I think that's a, that's a dead end. But they have to, but also the right um, have to understand the legitimacy of many of these complaints. If you're a young person now in Britain, um, it's very, very difficult to get a house. Um, it's very, very difficult to buy anywhere. Those are legitimate worries. Those are legitimate frustrations. If you're the descendant of a slave owner, uh, sorry, if you're the descendant of, a, of, a, of an owned person, a person who's been a slave, you are probably poorer. Uh, you are probably uh, subject to a, a range of experiences which are a consequence of, uh, of chattel slavery. So I think the right has to understand the legitimacy of some of these uh, and, worries. and I would say slavery is absolutely fundamental. That, that, that is a absolutely... At least in the US. But wouldn't, it, the also, US, yes, but wouldn't yeah. it also be fair <clears throat> to say that the most vital and vibrant democratic movement, certainly in the West and particularly in the US, have been identity politics movements, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, are you saying that those aren't legitimate, that they're not a manifestation of democracy? I'm saying that if they depend on the idea that 
Um, nobody can understand um, their arguments um, who hasn't had that experience. Not understand, but, but saying, simple, no, no. look, there is a distinction between drawing attention to problems that have been ignored or, or, or elided or not given enough attention to um, with a politics of zero-sum games. Quite often, politics, uh, radical politics, starts off with very legitimate complaints and then pr pr provides extreme or dangerous solutions to those constraints. So Me Too, absolutely there's lots of legitimate things going on. Black Lives Matter, absolutely there's lots of legitimate things going on. But if you go on from that to say that uh, a white person is, should be presumed to be guilty um, of all sorts of nefarious things, that is an illegitimate thing to do. In the discourse about the crisis of democracy, people often talk about Trump, and then in the next breath, they mention Brexit and they yes. shake their head. But what was so anti-democratic or undemocratic about the Brexit vote? And why does Brexit or should Brexit indicate that the vote, uh, that the decision, the supposedly democratic decision for, for, for the British electorate to leave the European Union, why is that a manifestation of the crisis of democracy? Well, there are two forms of crisis of democracy. Um, which are in tension with each other, and the tension between these two things is exceptionally interesting. One is elites not um, paying attention to the will of the people, but the other is the, the idea that the will of the people, unfiltered by institutions and constitutions and, and parliaments... Wise men like thing. you. Wise men like me, wise women as well, of course, um, <laughs> is, is, a problem, is, a, is a problem. And I think that the referendum is a classic example of that, because the referendum is an example of a democratic mistake. It's the idea that you can give people uh, a choice, yes or no, to a very complicated... Uh, to, you know, to a very complicated set of issues, you're allowed once to, 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 to make this decision, and the will of the people is final. I'm against referendum. Um, Mrs. Thatcher called them instruments of, of, of demagogues, and I think they are instruments of demagogues. I think they unleash monsters. I think they're the wrong way of making decisions. I'm in favour of representative democracy, and that means the people, um, every four, five, or however many years it is, um, voting for representatives who will make decisions so it, it for was, them. So, you, so for you, the, the, the it was crisis, too democratic. So the too crisis democratic. of democracy yeah. in, 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 the, in the Brexit case yes. wasn't so much the Brexit vote, but just the very nature of plebiscitary democracy. Absolutely, I was I, I was against it then. I, I, I even even more against it now. It's done. An Were you for or vote. against Brexit? I was against Brexit. I regard myself as being um, a strongly anti-Brexit. Brexit Eurosceptic. I mean, I think Europe has got a lot of problems. I'm very hostile to Europe in all sorts of ways, but I didn't like the referendum and I, I didn't like um, getting out of Europe. I wanted to remain within Europe as a Eurosceptic um, because I think we're losing more than we're gaining. What we're going to do, I think, through checkers is to have a bizarre position whereby we have to obey all of their rules with no say over their rules, the worst of all possible worlds. Why? Does economic upheaval undermine democracy? What is it about being perhaps an economic loser, an economic casualty that makes one sceptical about the democratic system and democratic political parties? Well, there are two things that we're really talking about. One is upheaval and the other is stagnation. And I think if you have a world with lots of up upheaval, but in the context of significant economic growth, that's tolerable because people are being asked to change their jobs, they're being asked to move their houses, but they're moving to better jobs, they're moving to better houses. They're, in aggregate, gaining. What we have now is a combination of stagnation and upheaval. Um, so you, you have to change your job, you have to change your house, you have to move around, but you're not, in aggregate, getting better off. And that's a lethal combination. Um, so the pace of upheaval is faster than it's been for a long time, but the, reward, but the economic growth is, is slower, and the rewards of that growth are going to a very narrow group of people. So this, it's a lethal combination, stagnation, rising inequality, and upheaval. Okay, Adrian, you've depressed me enough. Um, how to fix liberal democracy? Your magazine came up with a manifesto. What do we have to do here to fix it? The fundamental issue is um, the stagnant economy. Uh, in the West. The stagnant economy is what's poisoning everything because it turns the idea that, that, that we can all share in collective prosperity to the idea that we're all at war with each other.
We also need to deal with the inequality problem. A world in which you have a very small gilded elite that's seen to be not playing by the rules, getting ahead of everybody else, does, um, does create uh, resentment that needs to be... The elites the, the, the of London and New York and, New York, and San Francisco. Uh, uh, absolutely. So what they, do we do with that? Higher taxes? Uh, uh, just, I'm not against higher taxes. I'm certainly in favour of inheritance taxes, which prevents big fortunes from being, from, from, from being passed on from generation to generation. I'm, a, I'm against things like, like, like the idea of legacies at Harvard University and things like that. Anything that smells of aristocracy, of the transmission mm. of vast privileges from one generation to another needs to be attacked. Um, and I also think that finally we need to unify um, the two liberalisms, as it were, the liberalism that sees power coming from the people and the liberalism that sees con constitutional arrangements as being absolutely fundamental. They've been separated, they need to be unified. How does that happen? I think elites need to be less arrogant, particularly the European elites need to be less arrogant. They need to be less theological. I would say that we would have none of these problems that have been created by the Brexit and the rest of it if the Euro elites hadn't insisted on this theological notion that the four freedoms entail freedom of movement and we can never adjust or question that. That's, that's elite theology. That's weird. It's not just about the, the elites changing their behaviour. Don't the people need to reinvent themselves too? Well, I think I would say that... Um, the people quite often get a raw deal um, and that they have got a raw deal um, as a result of the sort of economic policies which we collectively as the elites have, have pursued. Um, that the elite bailed itself out in the banking crisis in the way that it wouldn't bail out coal miners. Now there may be systemic risks in banking but nevertheless at least a few people could have gone, gone to prison. In this country wealth and decision making has been overwhelmingly concentrated on London uh, and the you know, large chunks of the country have been uh, been left behind. So I think the notion that we have a self-serving elite that is looked after its own interests is true. And I think one of the great problems for liberalism is that liberalism in the 19th century was essentially uh, a philosophy of people who are outside the ruling class demanding reform within the within the ruling class. It was an outsider's philosophy, saying we need to open up opportunities to everybody. Now, liberalism has become the philosophy of the ruling class. It's been captured by a, a ruling class and a set of interest groups, and we need to pay much more attention to issues such as redistribution, such as regional inequality, um, and the frustrations of the elite. Now, I think that the Brexit vote was a mistake, but I think it was a mistake that was made for very, very good reasons, that large numbers of people thought it can't be worse than this. Mm -hmm.